I'm Katie and thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad you and your family are here and we would love to get connected with you. One easy way you can do that is text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website, therivertrch.cc, to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. Morning, everyone. So good to see you. Welcome everybody online. If you have a Bible, we'll be in Romans chapter number 11. This morning, I'd like for you to think of a time, uh, maybe right now, maybe in the past, where someone in your life, family, uh, co-worker, neighbor, they just, whatever the situation was, whatever the problem, you could not see eye to eye. Right? And whatever that was happening, whatever information you could give, whatever truth you could give, whatever, you know, you trying to persuade and to help them see, they could never get it right. I mean, they just couldn't see how you see things. Anybody? Can you think of a time like that? Maybe it's right now where you just couldn't see eye to eye. This morning we're going to talk about seeing eye to eye. And one of the best illustrations of this is back in the 90s, uh, when the NBA was good, unlike now. Uh, back in the 90s, there were two basketball players. One was really tall, his name was Manute Bull, and one was really short, his name was, his name was Muggsy Bogues. And they could not see eye to eye, as you can see by the picture. They just couldn't see eye to eye. We are in a study looking at why God. A study wondering when when things go wrong in our life, when bad things happen and that question pops in our head, why do bad things happen? Why does this happen? And studying how do we deal with things on this earth that are broken and that we're struggling. Like, I don't have to ask you, hey, anybody have bad things happen to your life? Everybody raises their hand. Nobody gets out of it. We're all in the struggle, in the broken world, with our broken bodies, where bad things happen. And if you know the Lord, even in knowing the Lord, you turn and go, Lord, I don't get it. I don't understand. And the study this month is to give you tools to be able to know the Lord, to be able to know his strength, his truth, and his peace so that in the storm, your faith is not shipwrecked, but yet you become stronger in your relationship with God. As the Bible said, that these storms can build us up, that God All things in our life, right? God will redeem for those who love the Lord. Do we believe that? Do we know that? So as we study this, we we want you to know the truth. And this this series, I call it a study because I believe it's so important to to jump in and and be in a growth community, to read the book online, or or to listen to other sermons preached by other uh, river location pastors, Because last week, as we've been walking through this, right, week one is learning the truth that God is in complete control. To know that truth. And last week I used the the illustration of uh, understanding why things go wrong and being able to be strong in your faith isn't just a, hey, here's a two-sentence answer and you'll be good. That's not what it is. I use the illustration of hitting a baseball. If someone says, how do I hit a baseball? You don't just go, you put the bat on the ball and go. You need to learn some things. This week, my my thought is these are tools that we have in the toolbox so that as we build our life upon the foundation of God, he is our foundation, that when the storms come, we have these tools that help us understand, that give us strength in those storms. So we've been studying these truths. Again, Pat in week one preached on God is in complete control. If you missed that week, Please go back and listen to that. It would be so helpful to you. Last week I preached on everything is for God's glory, to, for who he is and to praise him. And you may be in here and go, Pastor, you preached last week. I was lost. I didn't have a clue what you were talking about. 
what is fabulous at the River Church, we had eight other location pastors that preached on the same topic. You can go listen to each of them and be like, yeah, they were a lot better than you, Pastor. That's fine. But to learn that we're to give him glory in all of these things. But learning these truths, this week is this thought of eye to eye. The truth this week is simply this. God's ways are not our ways. That when we see God, the truth is, we don't see him eye to eye. We think differently than God. We see differently than God. We know differently than God. And understanding this will be one of these tools that will so help you when things don't go right. In Isaiah 55, 8, the Bible says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Ponder what the word of the Lord says here. As heaven is above the earth, so are my thoughts compared to your thoughts. This eye-to-eye thing that so many times we want to bring the Lord down to our level and go, no, Lord, I need to show you how to see this situation. And the Lord says, hey, my thoughts, my love, my kindness. Isaiah 40, who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult or who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Can we read the greatness and the glory and the perfection of God? Right? It asks, who taught the Lord? The answer is, no, nobody taught the Lord. Who does the Lord owe? The Lord doesn't owe In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, it says it like this, guard your steps when you go into the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Again, this setting up the, re- the religious, ritualistic walkthrough of things and people blind to the truth and blind to who God is. Verse 2, be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Again, all of this comes back to this thought of seeing eye to eye that we, we don't. And understanding where the Lord is at and where we are at is so important for the for the toolbox, for us in building our life upon the Lord and helping us have strength and understanding in the storm. In Romans chapter 11, Paul, really at the end of, chapters 1 through 11 are like a section of Romans, and then the 12 through the end are another section. But the first section really speaks of theology, of who God is, how he works, and who we are. And at the end of this section, Paul says this. Now, I just want to show you the, um, I'm just going to show you a paraphrase. And I'm going to show you a little bit out of context just to hopefully get you thinking. But at the end of Romans, Paul says how impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. Exclamation point. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? Or who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? So when you first hear that, maybe you think this. Is Paul looking to God and going, what are you doing, Lord? Like, who knows what the Lord, I don't even get it. I don't understand. Now, if you know some of Paul's story, 
You know, some of the things that he went through, I think, man, if I was in Paul's shoes, that may be my thought. Lord, what is going on? And the things that Paul went through and the struggle. And... But that's not what's happening here. See, when you read this passage in context, you're getting to the end of the, the theological section of this book. And many call this the doxology. And what that means is Paul comes to a place of singing worship to God. He comes to a place where he starts to praise the Lord. So look with me, those of you who open your Bibles, uh, Romans 11, verse 33. He comes to a place of praise and he says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unfindable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Here, Paul, through the Holy Spirit, gives us the theology, the truth of this is who God is. You read Romans and it's deep. This is who God is. This is his love. This is his son that he sent that you may be saved. This is the offer of forgiveness of sin. He says this is who we are as humans and this is who God is and his goodness and his kindness. He loves us. And then Paul goes, and I don't understand it all. God's ways are way beyond my ways understanding what God does and how he works, I don't get it all. This isn't the mathematical equation. He in it all goes, what I know, what has been revealed by God and seeing who he is and seeing his love and seeing his mercy. There are these things in life that I don't get, but I'm okay. And I can break out in praise even when I don't get it all or understand God because God is way beyond my understanding. This is the tool in understanding this truth. Trusting God in it all. So I said how Romans is this theology, well, as Paul explains who God is, Paul explains how this eye-to-eye -eye thing, how we aren't close to seeing God eye-to-eye. -eye. Paul in Romans 3, if you want to turn there, you're welcome to do that. He explains where we are at as mankind, as humans, compared to where God is. And in this thought, God's ways do not line up with our ways. So Romans 3, here's what Paul says about our ways. Verse number 9 says, For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greek, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Then he goes on to explain. He uses the throat and the tongue and the lips. He uses the mouth. Saying they're all, they're all full of sin. Their feet are swift to shed blood in verse 15. And their path are ruin and misery in the way of peace they have not known, there's no fear of God before their eyes. Here Paul explains where we are at compared to where the Lord is. Now last week, uh, maybe too many times, and you may have been annoyed with it last week, I came back to the point that in understanding the why, 
We have to understand who God is, how the, the, the scripture and how creation reveals who God is. But the way to get through that storm, you first must go to knowing who God is. Who is God? How does he act? How does he love? How is he just? How is he right? How does he respond? What is so amazing, the Lord has given us his word to say, hey, let me show you clearly who I am. So to know that, so when we as a culture walk away from the Bible and start to add or take away things from who God is, we begin to build a false God. And so when things go wrong, we look at that false God and go, I don't like how you're acting. That's not how you're supposed to act. And we miss who the real God is. So if God is not the genie in the lamp that some of our you know, culture is made up, and when things don't go how we want, we blame God. But the truth is, that's not who God is. So understanding God and his truth and his ways are so important. I don't know if I said this last week, but if you're interested in diving into that study, A.W. Tozer has a wonderful book called The Knowledge of the Holy. It walks through the attributes of who God is. Attributes of God are just his character that, that God reveals to us. If you're looking to study that, it'd be a great place to start. So to know who God is is so important. But also, what is also so important is to know who we are. And here, Paul takes time to say, hey, we need to know where we stand with God. Because if we don't know where we stand with God, the truth is we may not have our foundation on the Lord. Because if we don't know where we're at and we haven't humbled ourselves and confessed of our sin and know because of our sin Jesus went to the cross, our foundation may not be in the Lord. So Paul says, hey, you need to see where you are really at. In the beginning of this chapter, Paul starts with the Jewish people. He says, hey, you think you and God are good. You think, hey, we go through these ritualistic things, that puts us good with God, and we're fine. Paul's like, no. no." The Bible, the Holy Spirit says, no. The ritualistic things, does, that doesn't work. You know, it's the same with the church. There are many people sit in the church and go, I've walked through the ritualistic thing. I did the baptism. I do the uh, Easter and Christmas. I do the communion. I've done all of those things. Not realizing where we are truly at. Here, Paul, as one says, shows us our radical corruption. Talk about not being politically correct. Our world says, hey, everybody's okay, everybody's good, everybody's, you know, they're going to do it. And the Bible says, no, we're all radically corrupt. We all fall way short of God. There's no goodness except for God. And it begins this passage, what Paul does, he quotes six, I believe six Old Testament passage. There are 13 counts of indictments on the human mankind, or on us. And it says, none is righteous, no, not one. And you may be sitting there going, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. You're saying nobody does right ever? Like nobody? No. Mankind can do something morally right. They can, you know, uh, one says it this way, even the most vile person may occasionally do something commendable. But here it is speaking of the inner man. Here it is speaking to define it. The standard used here is the righteousness of God, which is manifested in the righteousness of Christ. And no one comes close to the righteousness of God. You continue reading in Romans 3, it says, All fall short of the glory, and if you're with us last week, and I explained that clear enough, the glory is who God is, his perfection, his love, who he is, we all fall short of that.
We're not righteous. We're stamped with sin. And to be honest, I don't think this is a hard on, uh, argument if you look at yourself, right? To say, hey, how about this week? You, you hold up to the righteousness of God. How about this morning? How's that going? Somebody pulled in your parking spot? <laughs> your child got up with that attitude? Your what? Nope, not going to go there. We have the law, the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments that says, hey, don't lie, covet, adultery. The Lord Jesus comes harder, right? And the New Testament explains that this is all a heart and a mind thing. When we think about those things, we're sinful. One man uses it, says it this way. He says, by saying that if the color of sin were blue, every aspect of us would be some shade of blue. And some of you are thinking, blue, that was a good color to pick for sin. Yeah. Some of you think maybe they should have chose green. I would have chose scarlet. But, you know, anyways. Sin. In our flesh. We all have sin. We all fall short. To be under sin is to be under its sway and its condemnation. I was reading in a story uh, in the, one of the commentaries I was reading told of a story of a city fell in love with this little duck that lived in a pond near the city. It said this poor little duck had uh, the, the pop can tops, the little plastic, those rings, somehow it had wrapped its beak all around that. So it couldn't open its beak. It couldn't open its mouth. And so the community saw it and they came out and tried to help the duck. But the duck kept running away. Every time goodness came to go, hey, we're here to help you, the duck looked at it as a threat to their life as, no, I don't want that. I know what's good and ran away from the help. This is a picture of mankind looking at the goodness and righteousness of God and who he is. As God comes and offers the gospel, we look and go, nope, that's a threat to my life. And we run away from being saved instead of trusting the Lord. As we keep reading through Romans 3, we see the effect of sin, that it's on every part of us. It's, it uses the illustration of a throat and our tongue and our lips and our mouth and our feet and our eyes. Everything's been affected. So now you may be asking, okay, pastor, we talked about the why. Why are you telling, how is it going to help me to know where I'm at Well, first, because we as mankind, if we don't realize that God is above us, what we will start to do is we will either try to elevate ourselves to God or we'll try to bring God down to our level. And in those situations, we can elevate ourselves and going, God, don't you know who I am and what I've done and how good I am? Or you pull God down to our level and think he is corrupt and evil. So it's truly understanding who God is that changes this. We also need to understand in these situations, most of the time, many of the time, we respond wrong to God. Let me restate that. There are many times that I, when I am pressed and things are hard and I'm lying on the floor with a kidney stone and going, Lord, what are you doing? We are pressed to not respond godly, but to respond sinfully. We start to realize where we are at. It brings us to a place where we can humble ourselves before the Lord and to know him. 
Job was that perfect example. Job 42 says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, Job 42, 5, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. What happened with Job? God, I knew some of you, but then I saw you more clearly. And when I see who you are, I humbled myself. I abhor my, I reject myself and I turn to you. And I turn to your strength. See, God's ways are not our ways. We also need to know God's ways are not our ways, and God's ways cannot be completely understood by man. In Romans 3.11, it says that no one understands, no one, no one seeks for God. To know that God's ways are way beyond us. Many times, I will joke about the difference between 8 o'clock gathering and the 10.30 gathering. Like, if you've been around, we have some fun laughing about 8 o'clock and how they act. I make fun of you at the 8 o'clock. I make fun of the 8 o'clock here, all right? Uh, and some of you are like, wait a minute, I'm 8 o'clock age. That's okay, all right, that's fine. In this series, it's very interesting to me. Because in this series of Why God, there really is a difference on how you respond to this question. And I really think there's this generational difference. At the eight o'clock, many of the people, when I brought up the question, do you ask why God? Their immediate response is no. Because growing up, maybe you can help me some of the older people in 1030, you're not allowed to ask God why. God is God, you are not. Suck it up, buttercup, and do what you're supposed to do. Older people in here, are you with me? That was the, this is what you do. And so to question God, you don't do that. You just trust the Lord. Now, 1030 is different. You younger people, I'm with you. No, uh, younger people, there is this, well, why God? Who God? What God? And there is this, okay, how do I figure out God? This is something, how do I, why is this? And, and what do I do with this? And so you may be asking, well, what's right? Well, I don't, I don't think either is right as long as you get to the Lord. What I mean by that, this generation, can I tell you something? You're not going to mathematically figure out God. That you can see his truth, you can see what he's revealed, and his love, and his care. But unless you get to a spot to go, whoa, God is way above me, and I'm going to worship him, you won't follow the Lord. Unless you get to a place to go, God is great and holy and good, and I'm not. And I'm going to praise him even when I don't get it. You won't honor the Lord. And the older crew, if you just hide it the whole time, because you're struggling and you just go, well, I'm just going to be quiet. And that, that's not good either. You can come and seek the Lord and know the Lord and find the Lord and go, I can trust the Lord. We got to get to a place where we see and know that God is holy. I'm not on the same level with God. He deserves the glory. He deserves the praise. And if I'm a follower of Christ, no matter what happens, I know the Lord has me. I may not get it, and I'm okay with it. Amen. This is really important, church. We're going to ask the worship team to come. No, just kidding, all right. (laughs) Lastly, in this, in knowing that, hey, God, we don't see eye to eye with God. It's this knowing that God is good. When you read the Bible, when you read, there's going to be times to go, I wouldn't have done that, God. Right, because you're not God. That's not how I handle it. Right, because God sees things bigger than you do and bigger than I do. So we come to Jeremiah 9.23 that says, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. 
Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. To know that God is the redeeming God. That no, the Lord can take this pain, this trial, and he says he will redeem it. For those who love the Lord, all things work together for good. In the series, as we went to Job, we see God redeem. We go to the blind man, we see God redeem. There are many of you, testimonies, right, in here that you went through a storm. Let's just see, you've been through a storm and you've seen God redeem. Anybody, you've seen the Lord's hand and his truth and he's real. There's the famous story in the Old Testament of Joseph. It's in the first book of the Bible. It takes up almost half of the book of Genesis. Starting in verse 37, or chapter 37 through the end, It's the story of Joseph. This unreal story of how Joseph, brothers, didn't like him. Why? Well, because his dad had a favorite son. That's not a good thing. And Joseph was a little arrogant, it seems. And so his brothers took him and they sold him into slavery. Well, they first thought, let's kill him. And then one of the brothers was like, nah, let's be good guys and just sell him into slavery. And I know some of you are churchies, so you've heard that story so many times. You're like, yeah, they sold him into slavery. No, no, it, awfulness. They sold him into slavery and went back to his dad and said, he's dead. Joseph's a slave The Bible says he continues to do what's right. And in doing what's right, he is wronged. And now he's not only a slave, now he's thrown in prison because he honored the Lord. Years later, through God's sovereignty, because God is in control, he brings Joseph out of the jail and uses him. Joseph becomes second in charge in probably the most mighty nation in the world at that time, Egypt. Through the Lord, Joseph points them and says, here's what we need to do. There is going to be a famine for this long. Here's how we need to respond or we'll die. And they listen to Joseph and are saved. Well, A time comes when these Israelite men come, Joseph's brothers, to Egypt because they don't have any food either. And Joseph sees them. What a wonderful story of revenge this can be. Nah. Why? Because Joseph followed the Lord. In Genesis 45, he said this, To his brothers, he says, Now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Verse 7, And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all the house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. In Genesis 50, he says it like this. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive. And they are today. Through the hardship, Joseph saw the Lord redeemed. Now, we don't always get to see that. There are times where, like, I don't understand, but we can trust the Lord is good. So, this tool to have 
is to understand where we are at. It humbles ourselves so that we can look to the almighty, good, just God and trust him. To know that he is good and righteous and just. During this week, as I thought of that saying, eye for eye, I just Googled eye for eye, define it, because just get ideas and thoughts, to not see the same way, to not agree. And I found that the origin of eye to eye is very interesting. Where did it come from? Well, most people believe eye for eye came from the Bible. It comes from Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52 says this. The voice of our watchmen, they lift up, the, they lift up their voice and together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Here, the Bible is speaking of one day the Lord is coming back. One day, the pain of this earth is going to go away. The struggle. And the Bible says there are those who are going to see the Lord eye to eye. No more veil. The New Testament puts it this way, that there'll be no more mirror that's dimly lit that we can't see. But then, face to face, we will see and know the Lord. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. It is the wonderful joy of truly knowing Jesus as our Savior, that this world is not our home, the death is not the end, that Jesus, we will see him fully for who he is, and we will glorify him. Church, in our walk in this world, it's temporary. Fight to know who God is. Fight to see his glory and to glorify him. Fight against or fight for humbling yourself, trusting him, and knowing that he is good. And rest on the promise that we shall see him eye to eye and face to face when Christ returns. Let's stand together. Listen, if you're here um, and you, you don't know Christ as Savior, you may have heard about him or like him, but you don't know him as Savior, please hear that the goodness of the Lord is manifested in Christ. Because God loves you. He knows, as we said, sin separates us from God. And Jesus came and died on the cross to take the wrath of God that we deserve and to place Christ's righteousness upon us, not because of what we've done, but because of what he did. And if you'll trust Christ as your Savior, repent of your sin, he will save you, give you new life, to give you his spirit and his strength to walk through this world no longer on your own strength, but with, with his. So right where you're at, you can trust Christ. You just tell him. There's no religious word game you gotta say. You tell the Lord, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need a savior and I trust that Jesus, you died on the cross and rose again. Save me and he will. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. When we rejected you, when we chose our own way, you love us and we thank you. May we learn to lean on your strength and your truth. 
thank you and praise you in Jesus' name.